This video has been brought to you in part by the Pixel Empire. If you're looking for some high quality, ready for framing, amazing original designs of game, TV and movie wall prints, then please head to the description right now because for a limited time only, not only can you get 20% off of any order by using the coupon code CADDY in big capital letters, but also you can get a buy one, get one free offer on any 11 by 17 poster that you'd like. All you have to do is leave a note at the checkout to say which poster you'd like at that size. You have to leave the note, otherwise the offer won't work. So thank you so much for listening and please enjoy your Christmas if you get these for Christmas because they'd be awesome Christmas gift Christmas Christmas Today! Greetings and salutations my beautiful people this here is Canis Retrospective and we're doing Uncharted 3 now so shut up get in the bath and fuck off actually please don't I'm, I'm only joking. But please do get in the bath because you smell like a donkey. Uncharted 2 was like a complete revelation, not only to solidly put PS3 on the map practically forever, but also for Naughty Dog. I could go on about specific awards and quotes from gaming media outlets when Among Thieves came out, but I don't think I need to. Look. Uh, I mean, just fucking look. I can't even conjure up the words to describe the crazy amount of praise this game got, and I honestly don't think that- Oh bloody hell, that doesn't even make sense, France! I honestly don't think that I can disagree with it at all. I mean, yeah, it's not the deepest game in the world, but for what it does do, it's brilliant. It accomplishes its objectives near perfectly. After that, I guess while the audience assumed they were still riding on its success, Naughty Dog almost appeared to vanish, with rumours floating around about their next project being a supposed apocalypse-themed game, and then rumours about a third Uncharted, which were both actually in development at the exact same time right after Uncharted 2's release under complete secrecy. Suddenly, on December 9th, 2010, Entertainment Weekly officially announced the latter to be true, a third Uncharted known as Drake's Deception, set for release on November 1st, 2011. What was interesting later on, though, was that both rumours turned out to be true. Once the Apocalypse game was then revealed in late 2011 to be The Last of Us, Uncharted 3 had already been out for a while at that point, maybe a month or so, and it was then revealed that Naughty Dog not only were working on both of these games, but also had split up into two different teams. One half to work on Uncharted 3 and the other half to work on The Last of Us. So basically, to go back to the start, Uncharted 3 was a game already planned and in development from the second Uncharted 2 came out. And not only were Naughty Dog on the ball with it from then, but they were also split up into only a part of the full team at the same time. Was this just a cry out for utter disaster and a stupidly cocky move on Naughty Dog's part? Or was it going to be the first game to prove to the world that a team with such dedication and passion for their craft could create a polished and professional product and practically half the amount of people and prove to the world that they're the best dev team for doing so? <gasps> I am so out of breath. Well, honestly, I believe the latter. When Drake's Deception came out, where it didn't blow me away like Uncharted 2 did, I was still loving the journey, loving the characters, and having a grand old jolly from yet another grand game that was actually twice the size of Uncharted 2 at 50 gigabytes as opposed to 25. Despite the fact that Naughty Dog seemed to think that everyone who lives in London speaks like a cockney, has no hair, is built like a triangle, and is a Jason Statham lookalike. I'm kind of insulted by myself. So yes, this game wasn't indeed a revolutionary product or a huge jump up from Uncharted 2. If anything, it's the perfect example of, if it ain't broke, don't fix fix it. But to spoil the critical reception this game got too early into the video, I gotta say, I didn't quite agree with it. It's a great game, don't get me wrong, but the constant tens it was getting just seemed really alien to me. I mean, it had more issues than Uncharted 2 for definite. Impressive work of half the dev team aside. And this is illustrated better through its storyline and how some of the elements of it padded out the gameplay for the worst. The story here was decent, but not as good as 2 though. This time it followed more fun-filled frolics from residential favourite Nathan Drake, but this time it began in London with Nate and Sully trying to sell Francis Drake's ring that Nate had on his position for over 20 years for a lot of money to some executive types. After the money turns out to be fake, the gang tried to claim the ring again and escape, only to be stopped by Catherine Marlowe, this game's villain, and a witch of a lady. <laughs> same cocky little shit. Who used to be very close to Sully in one life. It turns out the ring is actually a key to a decoding device in order to read many clues all over the world towards the whereabouts of the legendary Atlantis of the Sands, where Francis Drake apparently had a secret mission from the Queen in order to retrieve something. And that's honestly it really, of course with the same many twists and turns, classic returning characters from Chloe and Alina, shocking revelations and plot elements that genuinely affect everything we've come to know and love about the characters, and even a few new characters to add in that little bit of spice like loyal yet hard and sarcastic Brit Charlie. So. Wait, if Drake was on a mission from the Queen to find this place, why all the secrecy? I mean, it looks like he went to a lot of trouble to hide whatever he found, even from Her Majesty. I don't know. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, what was that? The thing with the story is that it tried to be deeper and more serious, and I think it really worked for the most part. I mean, the plot is still very entertaining, despite the fact there are not as many silly lines and funny scenes as before. That's impressive. 
but it did fail, in my opinion, in other places for just feeling a little bit incomplete. For instance, the game tries to jump into Nate and Sully's relationship, and where the intro exploring Nate's childhood and how he met Sully is strong, their bond is never explored again. Marlo as the bad guy is sinister and threatening, and uses a lot of cunning behind-the-scenes tactics to psychologically fuck with everybody, but when getting information on Drake, such as finding out his real name isn't Nathan Drake, and having genuinely game-changing information such as that, the audience never find out any more about it, and again, it's never mentioned again. It is much more interesting overall and mysterious than the others combined, and a lot more important and personal shit is at stake with the characters instead of just another random treasure to get or the main drive behind the characters being the end of the world. By this point you care a lot about these lovable and relatable characters enough to warrant every plot element meaning a damn and making every gun battle actually worth something. Everything here feels more intense than ever because of the personal stakes at risk but it doesn't satisfy in many areas. Yes, two story is a lot more simple and to the point but it works perfectly as its own secluded action adventure romp. It could have gone deeper but it didn't need to. Here though it's missing bits. Some bits work and others don't. Some villains come and go like the Pirate Ramses, I think his name is? I don't even fucking remember. Others stay around forever, build up their game massively, and then all of a sudden die in the most anticlimactic way imaginable. Much like Marlo herself and even Talbot, her right-hand man, there's barely any impact of their actions after the intimidation they strike from the beginning. Marlo sinks out completely nowhere, and Talbot is part of an anticlimactic final fist fight to just get shot and die. It feels more like Uncharted villain territory in that regard, actually. And these spider things, they just appear and vanish out of nowhere, like at random places. Where did they come from? Why so many? of them. Why are they the size of tennis balls? I don't know. For such a serious script this time around and barely any jokes, where it is extremely well performed and structured, it feels a little bit dry in a few places. <sighs> because of the way it doesn't deliver an impact even close to what 2 had going for it from how the character arcs all round off. It's still good though, way better than 1 for sure, and with more emotionally hard-hitting scenes and a mature tone that I really love the direction of, but it's not as memorable or tightly kinetic or witty or satisfyingly complete as 2, making it feel like a build-up to 4 for me. But a damn good one, don't get me wrong. Fun fact. Did you know that at the start of the game in the London bar, there's actually a very subtle reference and teaser to The Last of Us in the newspaper on the counter, in which it reads, Scientists are still trying to understand deadly fungus. Does this mean they're actually in the same universe and Sully turns into a horny clicker? We'll never know, and I'm not sure I want to. So yes, the story was still very enjoyable and better than one's, but ultimately a little bit disappointing to me from the ambition it was trying to reach and how it failed to score a few goals in a few places. It was still really good though, but just not as good or tightly written and compact as 2 was. Instead, how did the presentation fare? Well, it was one of the prettiest games ever made at the time and I still think it holds up today. It's in my top 10 prettiest games ever made in terms of the time it came out, which was now four years ago if you can believe that. So. Just take everything that was beautiful in Uncharted 2, make it even prettier, and make it look much better than some games nowadays. That's how you do it. Much like the way Crash 2 was a huge step up from Crash 1 and Crash 3 was just a refining on Crash 2, the exact same logic applied to Uncharted. The jump in visual and auditory quality from 1 to 2 was inconceivable, yet the difference from 2 to 3 was only noticeable in places. Naughty Dog used an evolved version of the same engine as 2 for improved physics, visuals, movement detail and environmental effects. It sure is a beautiful game, just as pretty as 2 but with even more visual flourishes everywhere. Not only with the environment detail but also with the increased amount of human detail. Now with additional effects with Nate reacting to people and objects around him, his limbs would automatically latch onto things and objects and it looked great, and with the animations, well, just look at Nate on a boat in an ocean storm. Yeah, it looks amazing. When getting footage, I also nearly died multiple times from just staring at the backdrop, so that's something. This was a game that really made you feel small, and I personally sometimes felt genuinely queasy from the heights you reached, but not in a ridiculously unrealistic way. It felt gritty and a bit too real, which added to my mental attachment. Creative director at Naughty Dog, Amy Hennig, explained that the desire for desert themes stemmed from wanting to push the team creatively and technologically, as organic elements such as sand, water and fire were technically difficult to credibly render with the animations. Which despite the issues, definitely paid off. The sand for instance still looks fantastic, look at it all. Yes it was all very similar to 2, but with a lot less ridiculous set pieces and more realistic colouring and toned down areas to match the more mature story, and there were equal amounts of variety but in totally different feels. The voice performances as well in my opinion were the absolute best, the actors here really got lost in their personas, and there were more emotions conveyed here than before, with more hopeless deliveries and more love filled deliveries and more genuinely ecstatic deliveries, it was, like the visuals, grittier and felt more real. The music was also great and again relied on the light motif like in Drake's Fortune but with more Middle Eastern instruments and shaky percussion almost sounding like insects rustling through the lusciously irritating sand. However, it was not quite as memorable as 2 soundtrack if you ask me. Fun fact. 
Did you know that in chapter 12, Ramsey's ship is called the Sea Ward, which may be a reference to Arrested Development where the character Gob has a boat by the same name. Oh, also there's Sackboy in chapter 9. Two bits of trivia and one fun fact. <laughs> Gameplay wise though? I honestly don't know what to say, it was so similar to 2 that there's not really that much point talking about it. <laughs> the gameplay was literally practically identical to 2, with only a few tiny tweaks here and there and extended to be even longer than 2, always welcome. Well I should say initially that what I mentioned earlier about the story dragging out some of the gameplay for the worst, well, that applies to the first hour or two of this game. Yes it's strong for what it does, but there was a lot of random running around and walking with no real gameplay as such, minus a few tutorial bits here and there. The first hour or two almost felt like a story driven and elongated tutorial, and luckily nothing like that happened again except the desert wandering scene in the middle of the game, but that worked terrifically as it does at that point in the story. But to engross any new players would have failed if you asked me at the beginning, a bit too slow for Uncharted standards. Once it got going though, it was great fun, and it was identical to 2. The more diverse, imaginative and difficult treasure hunting, the improved climbing and platforming with tighter controls and more exciting scenes to give off dread and tension, the shooting and feedback from the weapons being great, and even the puzzles, they were so much better than 1 and 2 combined, actually requiring some patience, experimentation and actual brain power, with all the answers not just being available in your handy dandy notebook. It's all here, but with a few more added features to make this the definitive Uncharted experience at the time. Firstly, game director Justin Richmond explained that it would feel more open than any other Uncharted games, and it said that despite not being an open world game, they'd still try to add in elements to that. At the time of saying that though, he said it was still up in the air how much gameplay there was going to be letting people wander around, but they aim to let you ride a thousand miles off into the middle of nowhere and still find action and adventure as you go. Well, that didn't work, did it? Yes, of course the game was still linear, and that initial feature didn't really pan out as expected, but the game did really definitely try to be more open, and it worked better than the last two for it. Platforming and climbing could be tackled in many different directions and methods, not just to find treasure, but get the upper hand on potential future enemies for better stealth attacks and safer entrance points. Not to mention the gun battle areas were a lot less corridory and much more open and immaculately designed so that you were never safe in any direction, almost like a multiplayer map in every section. Enemy AI was insanely improved to accommodate these more multi-directional battles grounds with all of them literally trying to flank you every second of the battle to make them more intense and difficult than ever. Not only did you have to dart everywhere to avoid grenades now, but the covers weren't safe at all since enemies were much more aggressive and determined to take you from every single angle, and if you weren't quick you'd be dead in seconds from an enemy that's right next to you behind your cover. Well not just from that, but also from the fact that I swear Nate was weaker in this game. Look at how many times I insta deathed, and look at how quick the game expects you to get behind cover after a checkpoint before you drop dead. It was insane compared to the other games. Not a bad thing, but much more challenging for sure. For the other tweaks though, well for starters you could throw enemy grenades back if you timed a little tiny chance window correctly, which added a lovely sense of risk and reward. Do you jump to another cover to make things easier but risk exposing yourself to death, or do you take the risk by throwing back the grenade with the mini timing and potentially fucking it up, or throwing the grenade against yourself and killing yourself, or succeed and gain a free explosion from the privilege? Small, but effective. Oh, and the melee was really fun as well, but definitely more challenging. For starters, if you succeeded in a fast combo kill, Nate could steal the weapon of the current enemy instantly for use. Very cool. You could get into group skirmishes at total random with enemies grappling you, counter attacks everywhere, and the ability to use the environment to your advantage and insta kill a few guys in seconds. It's not as deep as the Arkham games, but it's more realistic, it's a bit stiffer and it worked really well for what it was, and again it made melee more challenging, with very little room for error and lots of multitasking to get through. And before people mention these events here, they weren't quick time events, no, they were just button reminders for counter attacking and grapple escaping. But how would you like to apply this exact game mechanic of the melee into the final encounter? But just don't do anything different, don't add anything in original, don't make it more difficult, and don't increase the impact, the memorability, or the climax itself. Well, I don't care what you want, because Uncharted Char 3... It it did it. Yes, there were no bosses again and not even any insane vehicle encounters, disappointingly enough. Yet there was a final boss, Talbot. Not only a character who's built up to shit but amounts to nothing, but also is just a basic box standard and piss easy melee fight. Really lame way to end the game, especially since the platforming challenge was badass and one of the most memorable in Uncharted history. And that practically concludes my issues with this game. I mean, I would bring them up again like I usually do in these retrospectives, but honestly, I've mentioned them all, so I'd just be repeating myself. And so the final question remains. Sorry, before I do the flippy game thing, I just want to show off the um, Uncharted 3 Limited Edition Box 1 last time. I picked this up for £5 in a pre-owned shop. I couldn't- it was one of the best buys I've ever got. Look, it's the journal. It's the journal. It's Nate's journal as the game box. It is so goddamn cool, and I just love it.
Where's Nate's face? Look at him there. Look at Nate's face and Sully's face. Sorry about that. The final question remains. Does Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception, hold up today? Yes, of course it does, and even though I have a few issues with the story and a couple of the more unimpactful and unmemorable moments peppered in through all of the really bombastic and brilliant memorable moments, I can definitely still recommend this game. It's an awesome third instalment to an awesome franchise. I just don't think it's as good as 2 like everyone else seemed to think it was. To end the story off, well, as you can imagine, there's a lot of twists and turns to spoil, so I'll miss a lot of the middle out. But basically, it turns out that Francis Drake deliberately kept the Atlantis of the Sands a secret and abandoned his mission due to the fact that another cursed treasure lies within the city, an actual evil genie in a bottle protected by hallucinogenic water, and one that Salim, an actual enemy, helps Nate out to try and stop for the good of mankind. The English must not reach the city. If they unleash the power of the jinn, we don't have much time, do we? And after many trials and tribulations like this, and this, and please let's not forget this, Nate gets drugged a few times, he hallucinates scary firehead super mutants, then hallucinates his father figure dying right in front of his face, which I honestly believed myself and got so angry that the next few minutes of play were pure aggression. Really effective, Naughty Dog. And then after reuniting with Sully after pulling himself together, they both set out to end Marlo's plan, stop the evil escaping and ending the universe, and kill everybody because that's what they do all the time. After succeeding from two anticlimactic deaths and destroying yet another beautiful city because that's what they do all the time, they come home safely, Nate and Alina patch up their relationship, and fittingly enough, they all go home on the plane that saved them in an Uncharted 1, all thanks to Victor Goddamn Sullivan. If I had to pick my favourite one, well, it would be two, obviously. I've said it like 500 times. It's the best one. It's the funniest, the tightest, the most well rounded, the most memorable. It's just everything. It's everything. Despite my preferences in gameplay from the third Uncharted, Uncharted 2 definitely feels like the action adventure third person running, gunning, summer blockbuster video game it was trying to be, and it does it so well, I can't even describe it. I wouldn't say 3 was a disappointment at all, far from it, but I just don't think, after the epicness and the colossus nature of this game, I just don't think it could have matched up that well. I mean, I've still got high hopes for 4 though, I must say. And where did Uncharted end up after 3? Well, after 3 came out and gained so, so much critical acclaim everywhere that I agree with. In total, the spin-off games included, the series has sold over 21 million copies worldwide and turned Nathan Drake into a PlayStation icon, enough so that he was a PS All-Star even. There was an Uncharted PS Vita game, which is great, a really strange card game for Vita which I never played and never won to, it looks weird, and the board game, that, that, that looks weird too. And of course, there's the regular stuff, motion comics, a novel, and even a movie adaptation that's been in development since late 2007, and through a crazy amount of development hell from changing producers, actors dropping, writers dropping, and all sorts, that's apparently set for release on June 30th, 2017, making it a 10 year making of production. Hopefully whoever played Sully doesn't keel over by the final scene. And has Drake shown any signs of going away? Well, I thought he did after 3, but no, because in March 2016, Uncharted 4 A Thief's End is set for release, and holy shit, I'm excited. I'm all over this. Literally all over it. Everything I've seen has made me more excited, and it looks like a combination of everything I love in Uncharted 2 and 3, but put into the ultimate package. And the subtitle makes me think it really will be an explosion of an ending. Until then, Nathan and company, consider me wrapped up in your little stories, and consider me awfully excited for whatever is in store for your potential final adventure. Hello everybody, thanks so much for watching this video. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, or if you don't like it, please like, comment, share, subscribe. <laughs> if you click on the middle panel, you'll be able to see t-shirts that I have for sale now, which is also in the description. Go straight there to see the merchandise that is on the shelves. And also um, look left and right on the panels for two other random retrospectives that I've done in the past. And that's all I've really got to say. Thanks so much for watching. If it's your birthday day watching this video, happy frick birthday to you. And please remember to stay beautiful. Was this just a... Was this just a cry out for... Was this just a cry... Was this just a cry... Or was it going to be the first game in the... Or was it going to be the first game in the world to prove to... The or was it going to be the first game in the world to prove? Or was it going to be the first game to prove to the world that a team with such dedication and passion for their craft could create a professional and polished product with practically half the? Fuck. And so the final question remains. Oh my god, that does not doesn't work with the book.